You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Three, two, one. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm really excited to have this, this individual here with us. Chris Johnson, how are you doing tonight, sir? Doing well, doing well. I'm glad to be on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Looking forward to having a great time talking with you this evening. Yeah, and I, I really wanted to kind of get right into this because we were having a great conversation before we recorded, just like about how, like how the industry has changed and evolved, and also about having the right the right personality to survive in it, and and having mentors. And one thing that you were talking to me beforehand is how you let things roll off your back. And I think this is cool because it ties into this recent tournament you had. And in fishing, if you let things stick with you, I feel like you, you're going to get eaten up. You're going to die because it, it, you're going to always have that one fish. You're like, man, like if I just caught him, my day's ruined because I missed that one. And if you have that personality, like I even know that I struggle with that where I have fish buried into my brain of like if I, that fish cost me something and you are so good at just letting things roll off your back, it's no wonder so much success has, has started to come your way. You know, that, that tournament. It was it was just one of those things, man. That you know, I, I actually had an I guess you could say average season. You know, I didn't cash any checks. I just performed constant. You know what I mean? I I put five in the live well, good solid fish. And when I went to the semi national finals and found out there was going to be like eighty three boats fishing that thing. I was like, man, this boat, we get to like two spots, and those two spots go to the national finals. I was like, man, am I up to the challenge? And, you know, I'm looking at some of the names and seeing some of the jerseys, looking who I'm fishing against. And I was like, man, there's some good sticks ahead. And, I mean, like, people don't get it twisted, man. Just, I mean, just because you're fishing TBF doesn't mean these guys are, like, or slouches. I mean, not hardly. And one of the names um, that I noticed, a great guy, real Real good guy. I've met him several times. Fished the uh, BFLs open was Thomas Wooten, who was the um, ultimately was the winner for that semifinal. Great guy, a great personality. I'm super happy for him, and he fought hard. I mean, that was a tough tournament, and um, I, you know, I just went in and said, "Hey, you know, I'm just gonna go out here. I'm gonna give it everything I got. I'm just gonna fish. I'm not gonna stress." So I practiced two weeks before. I went to one of the creeks down there on the Lower James and caught a bunch of fish. You know, I caught a lot of fish. You know, I mean, probably in eight, nine pounds. You know, I knew I could get eight to ten pounds, you know, and I just wasn't satisfied. So I came and I was just going to practice maybe that Friday until, you know, I had to come off the water. I was like, you know what? If I really want to do well, you know, you got to put T.O.W. You got to put time on the water. And I went down there a day earlier and fished almost all day Thursday, fished real hard. And it wasn't until actually Friday that I found the power fish that I had. And I had one of my club members, Rob Racer. I mean, cool guy. Um, oh, man. I mean, definitely the best friend of mine now. Him and his wife, super cool people. I love them to death. And uh, he was on my boat, and we were like, well, you know, let's try this little, you know, tree line. We fished some cypress with a flip hand, threw a little frog, threw, some, you know, a spook. And I'm like, man, what's going on? I mean, like, I just can't catch him here. I knew I had something else, too. But I was like, man, I just can't catch him here. And we were just on the edge of this grass line, just going, going to one of the bays up there, and... Just fishing this little grass line. I said, you know what? I'm going to grab this chatterbait because the chatterbait for me, guiding on the Potomac, man, the chatterbait has just been, I ain't kidding you. I mean, it's like the new frog. And if I came with a good, good, good bag, a lot of guys knew, like, hey, Chris, he fished, you know, that frog hard. And, you know, my frog bait's been kind of limited. So I was like, man, I got to do something different. And, um, you know, there's a certain chatterbait I'm using. I mean, it's homemade. I can't really even show a picture of it, you know what I mean? But it's a it's a special chatterbait that I'm using, man. And, and man, I'm telling you, it was it was on them. It was, it was on them. And I got to the edge of this grass line, and I could kind of see where the water got dirty, and it was like a little transition. It was on a point, 
and I was going time. So I knew, I was like, well, if these fish are pulling out to this grass line. I mean, I wish I could take a picture of it and send it, but, you know, they were on this grass, this grass line. And I just knew if this tide went out, they they going to pull out to the outermost parts. So I just fished this little grass line, this little point in the grass line. And they were just sitting there on the grass line. And when they weren't hitting the chatterbait, I'd slow up and say, hey, maybe they're not in a chasing mood. You know, I'd flip a one-eighth ounce tungsten weight, black and blue, you know, Seiko style bait. Um, then I actually found out that June bug was a good color. Any, I'm telling you, anybody watching this, if you're fishing the James River, I, <laughs> I've heard it many times. It is true. Any worm and purple. I mean, moccasin blue, um, uh, you know, that June bug color, I think candy bug, those are all great colors, you know what I mean? But they seem to like that opaque, but it's something about, it's something about that June bug, that kind of purplish color, uh, grape, you know, those colors are, are, are great. Um, I actually had fish in, in Dyson Creek, that was another creek I went to, and I was flipping these areas. Um, same the same deal, you know, one eighth ounce weight, small weight. For some reason, that James River, I don't know what it is, but those fish on the James River, they really, 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 really are tired oriented. Um, I don't know because you're closer to the mouth of the, the the bay, and they just they're just extremely tired oriented. And any type of structure that you got down there, you know, just think about the tide. They're always going to be you know facing where the car's coming from and they're waiting for something to sweep in front of them. And I think one of the key things that I did while I was down there, um, just flipping that bait and letting it kind of fall through the current kind of naturally. You just you're not just like dum 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 just lifting up lifting up the rock. You just kind of lift the rod ever so slowly mm -hmm. and just letting the tide kind of do its thing. So it's and almost I, like fishing the upper Potomac or the Shenandoah River for smallmouth where you're just like almost fly fishing. You're starting above the current and just letting it slowly like go down with it. Exactly. And that's that's it was weird too was I, I I promise you, I wish I could think of name. He's got a YouTube channel and I was watching him. And he was using that Charlie Brewer uh, slider head, Rick. Man, I'm going to tell you something. That thing is nasty. And I don't know. It's like some of the old school lures, man. You know, it's like, gosh, man, I'm still people still use them because they were good and they're still good. I mean, um, Terry McWilliams, I'm a good friend of Terry McWilliams. I've talked to him. And, you know, kind of, he was like the godfather of the stupid tube. And it's like, does anybody throw a tube on the Potomac anymore? You know, does anybody throw a man's minus one anymore? And I know you've had Captain Steve Chaconis on on here, and Captain Steve will tell you about the man's minus one. Mm -hmm. Those old school ones, guys, if you got the old school ones, if you've been on his YouTube channel, man, don't throw them away. They can have the rusty hooks being beat up or whatever. Keep those things. They just don't make them like that anymore. They changed the mold. I forget what the year was. I know Captain Steve knows, but those man's minus ones were, were great crankbaits. So, you know, all, all said, you know, go back to those old techniques. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, because a lot of those old techniques still work. Why? Because they're not trained to it. I mean, a, a bass is, I always look at a bass like a dog. I mean, they're, you know, they see the same Senko. They see the same frog. I think that's why the frog bite's been off. It's just everybody's throwing in the grass. Mm -hmm. Everybody's throwing in the grass all the time. So they're seeing the same thing. You got to throw a, some type of frog that's different. And I think, you know, that's one of the key things now. You have to be different and you have to adapt. So, but um, no... With all your tidal experience, uh, for people that aren't really used to fishing a bunch of tidal rivers, did you go into this tournament thinking like, okay, I fished the Potomac, all tidal rivers are the same, or was there a wake-up call? And just generic information, do all tidal rivers behave the same, or are they all unique? You know, that's a really good question. And honestly, I, I had no idea. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I really didn't until I got my cabs license. And my dad actually lives in Biloxi, Mississippi. Excuse me, oh. Mississippi. And I know I will murder this thing on river down there. I think they called it the shooter to shoot him a buffer river. I know, <laughs> I know yeah, I, I ain't gonna lie to you. But it runs right through, you know, Biloxi. And I talked to Cliff Pace, he's a good friend of mine, and Cliff 
you know, he kind of cut his teeth early, early in his days, you know, fishing that, uh, that uh, southern, you know, uh, division of the BFL way back in the day before he got to the Elite Series and all. But one thing I learned is there are actually uh, two types of tides. And, you know, and we have, I believe, what's called a diurnal tide. And we'll get a tide roughly every six to seven hours. Well, in Biloxi, Mississippi, you're only going to see one tide all day long. And it's like 12 hours long, 10 to 12 hours long. I didn't know it. I, I had no idea. And that's what keyed me into understanding the tide on the Potomac, uh, the James River, um, even uh, the northern swing up in, on, on the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have, I don't know, six, seven foot oh, tide swings. That's something, brutal. Something crazy. You know, and I just didn't know. I mean, but when that tide flows, I mean, it flows. And even the James River, the tide there uh, is a little different. I would say you get four, maybe four and a half foot tidal swing where the Potomac, you may have two, two and a half, maybe a three on a full moon. And, um, the, man, fishing tidal water is way more than going on your Navy Onyx on your phone. And, and I do it, and... Um, it, it, it can still vary. I mean, that's why they call it an actual tide prediction. And for those that are watching this, I'm going to tell you, when you look at your tide charts, let's say you're fishing uh, Belmont Bay. I love Belmont Bay, okay? Well, you can look at Belmont Bay, and let's say that tide is high at 6.30 in the morning. Well, nobody said that the wind is blowing like 15 miles an hour mm -hmm. in Norfolk, Newport News, and you're wondering, like, man, why did the tide look awful low? Well, because it's already been sucked out down in Newport News. So, and the same thing can happen in the reverse. If the tide's coming in, you get a really strong southern wind, southeast wind, it'll change up that tide and and you'll have what you know they call these super tides where it's it's a foot a foot and a half above normal. So you can't like look at the, the little aspect of it all, but you have to look what's going on in the whole Chesapeake Bay system, because whatever's going on in Newport News, Norfolk, I mean, that's going to affect the whole Chesapeake Bay, and I don't know what the displacement is in, in the six-hour tide of the Chesapeake Bay, but, you know, you get those winds that drive the tide, it can make a humongous difference. But I think one of the biggest keys for guys that do not fish tidal water, they come to fish tidal water, first of all, definitely, definitely, definitely check your tide charts. That is important, not just for fishing, but your safety. Because you go on the James River, there's some of these creeks down there, man, you will be on a mud flat and mm -hmm. you'll be stuck. So, I mean, that's the most important thing. You know, if you're pre fishing, Check those tide charts. And the other thing is check your weather. Just because, like I said, you're on the Belmont Bay area, you know, if you got a tournament, check your weather down south too because that's what's going to determine, um, you know, that tide going out or the tide coming in. So that's a, another key thing. And then also when you're fishing, fall, chatterbait, whatever it is, I, I do it all the time, excuse me. When I'm out there fishing, I'm notating the time every time I get a good catch. Not just marking mm -hmm. on my death line. I'm looking, okay, it's 9 o'clock, 9 11. And I, what I'll do, I'll go back home and kind of do a mental evaluation. Okay, if that fish, you know, seemed like they kind of turned on, I had a nice little flurry of, you know, five, six, seven fish. And in that one hour time zone, well, I know an hour later tomorrow, that's when they should bite. Instead of 9-11, they might bite, start biting like 10-15. You know, it happened today. You know, um, you know, I look at my tide chart and the area I was in, you know, it was almost dead, dead low tide. I mean, I mean, I had to literally like jump in my boat because the tide was so low. And I noticed that, you know, I'm looking at my side image and it's like, man, where the heck are these fish? You know, I see the bait, the bait's like down low, they're not moving. So I'm like, something's going on. And, and, and this I mean, is great information for people that don't grow up on a tidal river. And, and it's like the James is a, gr a great example of this since, since Potomac is your home. Mm -hmm. You only have certain windows if you're practicing where you could be on the juice, but if it's not the right tide, 
it would look like the worst spot in the world. So then when you were practicing for this event and you have the whole river, and I believe I, I could be wrong, but you said that you had about two to three days of practice. Were you thinking mm-hmm. I'm going to fish the whole river or just fish a couple of areas through the whole tide to get a vibe of what your strategy will be? How do you approach practicing on a tidal river that you're not familiar with? That's an awesome question. That's a really good question. Um, a lot of guys, you know, let's say they're going to fish, um, prime example. I'll, I'll look this up right now. So, let's say you know I know there's um there's a, a Potomac River tournament going on on the fifteenth of October, which is this weekend. So, what I'll do, I'll go to my Navionics on my phone. I don't know if you'll be able to see it or whatever, but um, like right now, you know, uh, duh, 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 duh. let's look at Mad Woman Creek. So, on Mad Woman Creek or Indian Head. You know, I'm on my Navionics right here. I know you probably, probably won't be able to see it really good, but you nope, kind of see that little, probably see that little blue icon. And that right there is my tide, tide area for Indian Head. Okay. So what I, what I'll do is I'll get on that Navionics and you can do the same thing on your, on your graph, on your Humberd, your Lawrence, whatever you have, um, your Garmin. Um, and what I'll do, I'll look at that tie talk. Wow, this is actually a good time to do this too. So you can clearly see this is in trying to get it. This Perfect. is Indian head right here. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I believe what we're looking at was a nine oh eight at at high tide. Mm-hmm. So th- let's just pretend that's AM time. So it's eight o'clock right now. Believe it or not, man, them fish would be biting right now. Them last two hours of that incoming or outgoing tide. Is when I do my best damage, and I've, I have found out, Thomas, it's not just salt water, but it's fresh water too. Those last two hours of that tide is when they're going to do the most damage. Now you can catch them all, all, all throughout that tide, but what I do is try to match up my practice time to exactly when we're going to launch for that tournament. So let's go to um, the fifteenth. So for the, a lot of those guys. So Saturday the 15th and in the head, of course, you know, a lot of guys fish out of Smallwood State Park. A lot of those guys fish out of Lee Savannah State Park. You know, we're talking DMV, so we're all in this same circle. Mm-hmm. Potomac teams, you know, local BFLs, regionals. So the high tide at, at Indian Head is going to be 1148, uh, it looks like 1148 p.m. Okay, on that, on that, excuse me, yeah, that night. So those guys are going to fish the tournament. They're probably going to launch close to 7 o'clock. So those guys are going to be launching again right around that time frame. So they're okay. going to be almost They're almost going to be at dead load. It's going to be 641. Mm-hmm. So 641, number one, you might catch, you know, maybe a little bit of that incoming tide just as you start fishing if you're in a Mad Woman Creek area. And here's the biggest thing is, now, if I know my tournament and we're launching at 7 o'clock, I know I'm going to have 20 to 30 minutes of incoming tide, okay? Ah, okay. So what a, guy, a lot of guys are like, hey, man, I'm going to fish, you know, the week before and see how things are and all. I don't like doing that. I don't, I don't like doing that because if I've done that, August, let's look at October the 8th. Now, we got an incoming tide. Look like we're going to be incoming tide most of that day. Well, if I do the same thing around that same time, and let's say I start at 7 o'clock in the morning, well, look what we're going to have. Okay, we're, yeah. We're going to have totally opposite tide. So one of the biggest pieces of advice that I can tell a lot of tournament anglers that are fishing the Potomac, the James, it, 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 it works for most of the Chesapeake Bay uh, rivers. You Always want to fish two weeks before your tournament because if you look two weeks before your tournament, it's going to give give you pretty much that same type of tide. And I know there's other factors, but we're talking about tide. So two weeks before the 15th, that's when your tournament is the 15th. But we're going to look at the same area, but we're going to look at um, October 1st. So if you want to fish that tournament on the 15th, you should be there October the 1st to get your tide water experience. So you know kind of like 
how the time flow is and all. So let's look at October the 1st. So on October the 1st, boom, we can clearly see we'll have an income and tide very, very similar um, mm, wow. to what we would have on the 15th. So that's why I say always practice two weeks before. I mean, Thomas, I mean, the, the truth is my uh, region actually had uh, a tournament um, the week before um, or semi-national. I, I intentionally did not go down there because if I went down there, I knew that I was going to have an opposite ties. And if I caught fish, I was going to be locked into that pattern That's and it was not going to work. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go two weeks before. And I didn't, it was funny because I didn't even practice the area that I got all my fish. I didn't even practice it, but I wanted to know how that water's moving. When are they going to feed? And I mean, it was, it was, it was classic, you know, now the, the, uh, second part of that, of that equation, the intangible, I'm going to say is summertime is when it works the best because summertime, the fish aren't, aren't doing the big moves like pre-spawn or during the spawn, um, especially pre-spawn. I'm going to say especially pre-spawn. The reason why, well, when you have an incoming tide or an outgoing tide, those fish are always moving. They're always moving. That matter of fact, I, I, this is just my personal opinion. I think pre-spawn, they're moving more than any other time of the year. So when I'm trying to practice, yeah, I may have that same tide, just like I explained to you on the 1st and the 15th or whatever, but those fish may not be there on the 15th. And the reason why, because we're in that pre-spawn period where they, let, let's say they were on main lake points or the main river points. Well, two weeks have gone by. Well, they may not be on those main lake or, or main river points anymore. Be quiet because they've moved in that first third, you know, that first third of the creek or a bay, first couple of bays in these creeks or whatever, because they're looking to spawn. They don't care about the tide. All they know is when the tide's coming in, they're going to be moving into all these creeks. Um, when they go, when the tide goes out, I don't know how much moving they're going to do. This, that's that's a good question. My personal opinion, I don't think they like leave the creek and go out to the main river. I, I just don't believe they do. I think they more or less go to areas that have shallow flats nearby and then deep water nearby. But once they're locked and there's low tide and you got your high tide, let's talk. We're talking like mid May on the Potomac. You know, a lot of those areas of community holes, everybody knows, you know, Acapo Beach on the Potomac, you know, Belmont Bay. I sat there and looked at three, four pounders on a dead low tide. If they're not going anywhere because they're locked. So, um, and, and that's a really good thing to keep in mind because, like, for the Potomac River, compared to, let's say, I don't know, like the Delaware or places like where I mm -hmm. one, where you have like Absolutely. a 30 foot swing, yeah. it's going to be bone dry. Potomac doesn't move too terribly when you compare it to different tidal waters and then you go to the james and what i'm feeding into is the the biggest two strategies are you're going to do a milk run or you're going to stay put and fish it through mm -hmm. going into the the tbf did you have a generic idea of like are you going to milk run are you going to sit or did you have to let your practice play out first before you made that decision day one of the tournament i tell you what's all was that that was that was in my mind the whole tournament and I took some gambles. I, I really did. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I sat on both days in one hole. I literally did not move. If you see my graph at the end of the tournament, I mean, I'm going to draw it out to you. I mean, this, I mean, my graph looked like that at the end of the tournament. I mean, it was, I, I, I didn't go, I didn't go anywhere. I mean, it, it looked like that. You know, you might have had one little spin off where I came in, came into the area, but I mean, it, it, it looked just like that. I mean, I just, went nowhere you know i think i i i moved in an area that's maybe the length of a football field the whole tournament and, and this is the fun part this is the fun part so because this is what i love about this because as an athlete myself you know doing collegiate stuff is the mind of the athlete the mind of the, the guy competing okay so you're sleeping you're sleeping right ready to get up for day one of the tournament do you know your strategy or are you still like, oh shit, what the hell am I going to do? Man, I ain't going to lie. I ain't going to lie. When I left out, I knew what I was going to do. And I was like, man, okay. I, all I knew, I had a, I, I caught a good one there. 
And I was like, man, I don't want to beat these fish up. I said, Lord, just let them be good quality. Okay. And, um, man, I just I hooked my first one and then got my second one. The third one was like, a you know, almost a five pounder. It's like, oh, my God. And when I seen that, I was like, I think I don't think I'm going anywhere. And I mean, it, it was it was crazy because. And this is this is day one, right? So it, by it is with day one, and I'm sitting there. So day one, you got three in the box. What time is it? What time of day? Are we oh man, about? I mean, this three? was like ten o'clock or something. So ten, you got three good ones. Yeah, in I got box, three good ones in the straight. box, and Mister, like I don't know, four or five, you know, because they were short striking. Damn. And I'm like, man, you know, I'm, a, I'm like, man, if. if if this day is like this, I'm like, man, somebody's going to come in. I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. somebody's going to come in 18, 19 pounds. I mean, I was like, there's region eight guys here that fish all the time. I said, man, if I'm having a good day today, somebody's going to come in here with 18, 19 pounds. So, so at 10 o'clock, you got about how, how much do you have in the box right now, you're thinking? I'm thinking, you know, somewhere around 10, 11 pounds, somewhere in that okay. down that range. And because my head's like spinning. I'm like, oh, yeah. man, man, I mean, all I know is just keep chucking, keep chucking the whole time. <laughs> And, you know, then I get five in the live well, and I'm sitting there like, man, I don't know. I think it was like, they were like, you know, good solid, you know, two pounders or whatever. I'm sitting there like, man, I'm probably sitting there somewhere around for like 14 pounds. I'm thinking, okay, that might be, you know, maybe good to stand in the check line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm calling, I mean, like ounces at a time. And I'm sitting there like, man, it's getting close to that time. And all the while, I'm telling my co-angler. I mean, I'm literally trying to help him, man, because he ain't got fish in the box. And he was an older gentleman. Super nice guy. The guy was like 70 years old. I ain't kidding you. Super. And he was from he was a West Virginia. Um, um, I think his name was Bob Moser. Really freaking nice guy. I ain't going to lie to you, man. He was like a grandfather type, you know. And he was, like, happy for me. And I was trying to help him out at this point. Cause I'm like, man, you know, because he was throwing a spinner bait. He threw, uh, you know, Texas rig worm. I was like, you know, I told him, I was like, Pops, you know, I'm going to get you on over here and check this grass line. You know, at that point, we're on low tide. So, um, you know, I'm throwing a chatter bait. And I'm like, mm -mm, you know, like ripping out the grass. And it's like it's getting harder and harder to throw it in those areas where I see the water's kind of clean. It was kind of hard. So what I did, I ended up backing off and just trying to slow up through the sinker. And just every time I felt, you know, the, the grass, I just kind of you know, popped it one time and then killed it. And when I told him what to do, I mean, at this point, I'm like, I'm kind of looking at it as a guy trip, you know, because, yeah, I'm fishing from my own pot. But one thing I've learned, man, in, in, in terms of fishing, man, it's just you don't have to be a tool tail hole, man, you know. Because that guy, I want him to have a good time, too, you know. And I put him on this one little spot, and he flipped his little sinker over there. I think he caught one of those, like, three pounds. And I think it was the biggest fish he caught in the whole tournament. But um, he had, a, as I got my stuff falling on. <laughs> now, now, did you think 14 pounds, like, when you're in your – this is your first spot. You have about 14 pounds. Did you feel like that put you kind of mid-pack, or was that – were you happy with that weight? Or were your wheels spinning, like, I need to move spots? Like, where was your mindset right oh. there in the day? Well, I mean, I think it was around that 12, midday, 1 o'clock, and I was like, well, I knew I had some other spots, but I was like, you know, I caught that five pound. I was like, there's probably another one around here. And then I just, I got locked. I mean, I got locked. I was like, you know what? I said, these fish are quality in here. I had fish in practice in another area. And they were just, you know, they're like pound and a half fish. I mean, if it was a numbers tournament, I mean, I probably wouldn't even fish there, man. Because, it, you know, there weren't like a ton, ton of fish, you know. I'm talking, good. It, it was a spot for maybe like 15 bites a day, and but you had okay. to fish it clean. But I had other spots. I mean, man, I could probably catch 15, 20, 25 fish, but they were like booking pound four, pound eight. And it was like seven, eight pounds ain't going ain't gonna to cut it. So why didn't you listen to that voice in your head? What, man, what kept you there mentally? I, I, honestly, I think it was that big fish that got me. I was like, man, you know, I, I've always... I don't know. I remember fishing my with, with my brother back in the day. It was like I always say, never leave fish to find fish. And that's the only Amen. That's, Amen. The, that's the only <laughs> thing that came with his like never leave you just gonna find there, man. And I've noticed mm. that on the Potomac too. It's like you'll you'll have an area 
And it would be like, boom, boom, boom. I mean, you catch some boots, and they're like two and a half pounds. But it's like, you need that kicker. And sometimes I feel like I can't get it there. But, you know, when I seen that five pounder, man, it, that's, that's what, that's, I think it was like 498. You know, I, I wish it was over five. But um, that's, that just kind of locked me in. And I had other areas, like I said, Thomas, that were, they were pretty. They were really nice areas. It's like, and I, I thought about it. It's like, well, if I make a run up to over the dam, that's going to be, you know, 20 or so minutes. I mean, I'm fishing off a, mm -hmm. a brand new uh, 2021 Yamaha full with a 150. And these guys was like, you know, 250s and they're running 75 mile an hour. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's one o'clock, right? Yeah, it's, it's like one o'clock. I'm like, man, you yeah. know what? I need to, I, I can't catch them running. I need to catch them with yeah. my pole in the water. And I just kept on grinding, kept on grinding, kept on grinding. Only concern that I did have. It's like I didn't want to beat up those fish too much, and then day two don't have nothing. That was it. Were you thinking about protecting the spot? Was that also a part part here where you feel like <laughs> I had to stay there to do a little like defense? There was some defense, um, at and, 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 and a, and a point because there were because people don't talk about that in fishing. That's a big strategy too. Oh, if you feel like you're doing a multi day tournament, like you just have to like hold the spot down. Yeah, because it was two kind of thoughts defensively, and 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 it's real. I mean, Van Dam, all, all of them. You know, have yep. to have that deal. And, you know, there were two other boats that are in my area. Um, one was on the one side, one was on my side. They come to find out, you know, um, at the end of the tournament, it was my club president. And, you know, he gave me some respect. And it, it was really weird, real funny, you know what I mean? And he was having a tough time. And he's like, man, dude, man, you know, you know, we're, we're club, we're club members, man. We try to help each other out. Try to, you know, I'm not going to like here's the GPS coordinates and stuff like that. But I try to help him out. And you know, when he said something, he said, "Are you going here?" And I was like, I kind of didn't want to show my cards. And it was a little, um, because <laughs> he had the early boat draw, and it was a, it was a little um, displeasure on my part. But later on, I kind of understood kind of what happened because he told me he's like, "Chris, if I knew you were there, I wouldn't even came there, or whatever." Oh, and insane. and so he was there. But you know, we we shared the whole. It wasn't like no bad word, no bad blood, nothing like that. And honestly, truth be told, I mean, he kind of went down a bank. I think his colon ended up catching like big fish in the tournament. It was like almost seven pounds. I think it was like oh, it was like six six two. <laughs> So that what that's what told me it's like man there's some nice fish in this area, and uh, and it's funny you know his co angler hit this was this was real funny, so his co angler from day one was my co angler for day two, so my oh co angler my got was in the same water both days, <laughs> literally the same area for both days, and uh, I thought that was kind of crazy, but. So, so cool. I went on the other side of this little grass flat, and I mean, I was getting desperate. I mean, day two, man. I, so, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I so, don't even so, want. <laughs> yeah. So you you got about fourteen pounds, right? So you weigh in about fourteen ish pounds. Yeah, fourteen or four. Right? Uh huh. When you're going back to the hotel, where is your mind at with your strategy to adapt? Because where are you in the standings right now? Like going into day two. Yeah. So after the weighing on, on day one, I'm sitting like. It was like, man, Chris, you did good. I'm like, I did good. I'm sitting there like, I don't know about that. And then, um, you know, the, uh, the weight match was like, you know, 1404, Chris, now you're good in third place. I'm, and I, Holy so I'm sitting there watching the weight and guys coming back with like two fish, three fish, you know, 549, 6.89. I'm sitting there like, great day. You know, I'm like, what the heck is going on? I mean, then I hear like a 10 pound, 10 oh eight, and I'm sitting there like, man, I'm waiting to hear like 15 and 17, mm -hmm. and it's just it's not happening. I'm like, is this really I mean, I'm kind of like pitching myself. <laughs> it's like, man, is this really happening? And uh next thing I know, I don't see any boats, I don't see anybody coming, and I hear a tournament director, he's like, last call for fish. I'm like, are you serious? I'm looking like at that point, man, I'm looking in the, the parking lot and seeing if anybody's pulling out bags and stuff. It was like, pinch me. This can't be real. I was like, man, this can't be real. And they closed the scales. And I'm like, man, like, wow, I'm in third place, knowing that I got to be in second place to make it to the national finals. And I don't know where that was going to be. I'm sitting there like, 
God, is this really, is this really happening? Man. How do you... It's so easy when you're not in the lead of any race to, to like push yourself. It's so much easier when you have people ahead of you. But when you break out and you're in the lead like that, and you're like, oh shit, I'm winning this thing. <laughs> How does that mess with your head going back into the hotel room and prepping the next day? Oh man, I, I'm going to tell you, and I'm glad you kind of use that analogy. Back in the day, when I was in high school, I ran track. I was a, I was a dash runner. I, oh, really? I ran 100 meter dash. and Oh my God, I, I probably couldn't run 50 meters now. But, <laughs> but you know, I like the way you use that analogy because it's like you're looking on sides like, man, you know, I got to put on the Jets. This dude's like catching up, you know. But when you're out there on order and like nobody's kind of around you or you don't see fish mm -hmm. catches, you're like, am I doing good? Do I need to move? Like, what do I do? And one thing I told myself is just you're not fishing against them. You're fishing against these fish. You just catch the biggest one. Just keep grinding. Keep grinding. <laughs> that night, um, I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, I fished Battlefield uh, Anglers of Virginia. We're a TBF Region 1 club. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, that finish that I had was not all me. It was my club members that believed in me. It was my club members that talked to me that night. Chris, you know, hey, man, you're doing good. Just, you know, fish. Do what you've been doing. Don't spin out. Um, Michael Cooper. You know, I got to give a shout to my boy Michael Cooper and Lil Dell. Um, you know, I stayed in there. Um, they camp a man. They opened up the camp. We had good old time, and oh, cool. you know, I mean, that's one of the things you know I'll get to later on. But you know, in TBF, we as a club, man, we look out for each other, and man, it, it was like even though we're fishing against each other, um, it was a sense of like camaraderie, you know, encouragement. And I'm telling you, those guys, I slept well. I slept real good. I wasn't even thinking about what I need to do tomorrow. I just knew, just, hey, just go out and fish because they call me, they talk to me. And I, that's one of the things that you get in, you know, a TBF club. You're going to have good guys that you can talk to, man. It's, it's basically like, we're like a family. And um, day two comes up and, you know, I'm, I'm like, man, I'm like, Gunny, my uh, friend Scott Favors, he's like, Gunny, I think I got your partner. And that, I mean, that's a whole, <laughs> and that's a whole nother animal. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. And before we get to day two, so his partner had to get a hook out of his thumb. And oh God! Ah. I, Ugh. I, man, oh man, oh man. I, I, I tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to pull it up. I'm telling you, Scott, Scott, I've known Scott Favors for over, oh my gosh, probably over twenty years, and, um. I, I think he had it as his, uh, as his, uh, what do you call it, uh, avatar or whatever on, oh yeah, so, so this is my buddy Scott, you know, and this is his thumb. Ah, oh, yeah. And. Good Lord. And that is a trailer hook from a spinner in the, bait. In the bone? In, the, down there in the bone. Oh, God. And. Oh. So oh, we dude. we had to, me and my buddy Paul Smith. We had to uh, grab his truck and his and his and his boat. And he like so. And this is what we do. We look out for each other. So you know, had his boat and his truck right right behind my rig. And we said, well, we don't know what's gonna happen, Scott. And so what we did, we put his boat on charge. We made sure his stuff was secure and everything. And you know. Anytime one of us is having a hard time, man, that's what we do. We step up and we help each other out. And, you know, he came that next morning and he thanked us all and everything. And he's got this bandage on. And, of course, he showed that x-ray and that thing was gnarly, man. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. But he was telling me, man, and he was like, man, I hope I'm able to fish because, you know, ripping stuff out the grass. He was having a hard time. And you know that's what I had to deal with at the end of day one, helping my helping my you know my partner out and make sure he was good and able to fish on day two. And um, so we got him straight. He was able to fish on day two. I, I don't know how he did it, <laughs> but after that injury, it was pretty gruesome. So day two, day two comes, and they launch a the flight out. I think I was both. Uh, da, 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 da. I think it was boat five on the first day. 
out five. And second day comes, we go in reverse order. So I'm like watching like what seventy eight boots go in front of me. And what's going through my head? Like, man, is anybody gonna be in my hole? Is anybody gonna be there? God, yeah. So I mean, your thought is you're gonna start there then. Yeah. That's your that was my that was my that was my thought. I was like, I ain't going nowhere else. I said, I'm gonna live and die there. And um man, then you know, you know, boot five, you know, could they do a reverse reverse order? They call boot five. I mean, at this point, man, I got butterflies in my stomach. I, mean, I feel good like like beforehand and it's just it's always around that long time, man, that like everything goes through my head. But I had to keep training myself. You're going to there, you're going to do the thing and you're going to die there. And I was it was kind of a rude awakening. And I don't know, probably around boot 50, 60 maybe, there was like this crazy fall. And I mean literally almost a whole uh uh, flight was out, you know, the whole flight was out, but, you know, flight one, two, and three, of course, we're in flight three, and I'm a, I'm a licensed captain, and I'm going to tell you, I hit this wall, literally anybody that went up in the Chickahominy River hit this wall of fog, and when I'm talking about wall, I mean, it was like some 300 stuff, I mean, it was like, and like, I couldn't see nothing. I mean, like, I, I went from, you know, 50 something to like, maybe like 20, 18 and I'm like looking at my chart, my bread chrome, just to make sure I'm like not running into a point or a cypress tree or anything. And I'm, you know, I'm nervous. And my co he's like, dude, you're like the most respectful driver I've ever been with. And, you know, because I'm looking out for this guy's safety too, not just me. And, um, you know, at this point, you know, I'm looking for like boat waves and listening for horn. I mean, I'm, I'm hitting my horn like three times or whatever, you know, because I don't want to get in trouble. You know, I want someone to hear me if they're on idle. So I pretty much almost idled, you know, to to my hole. Um, it took a while, <laughs> but we got there. And uh, once I got there, I seen my club president there. And, you know, he was fishing my hole. I was like, God dang, he was on it. But I had some other areas adjacent that I was on some fish. So I didn't let that spin me out or whatever. I mean, I don't own the water. You know, anything like that. And we, did you think about that while you were driving there? Like, okay, there could be somebody on my spot. Oh, yeah. And then did you already have a backup spot in mind, like that you were going to hit immediately? Or did you wait until you got there to make that decision? Or, no, I kind of waited until I got, that, got there to make that decision. I knew it was a possibility. I knew it was a possibility. But the area that I had, I, I believed, you know, I could catch more if I expanded my area. I just got locked in in this little area. I mean, I ain't kidding. You. It was a little of a football field. And, um, you know, once I kind of got the big picture of what was going on, I said, well, maybe I can slide over, you know, this way, maybe, you know, 40, 50 yards or go down this bank, you know, 40, 50 yards. And, you know, um, caught, caught, you know, had a few good bites there. And, I mean, um, I think uh, da, 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 930. I believe I had like two in the well by like nine thirty, okay. but I had a ton okay. of bites. I had a ton of bites though. And it's like, gosh, man, you know, and it was so crazy because you know it was in my head. I was thinking about putting some type of trailer hook. I was going to get some braid and 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 throw a treble hook on my like a stinger hook on my uh, on my raid swimmer, a straight king, straight king raid swimmer. And I was like, man, is that going to then in my head, it's like, well, is that going to impact the, the action of the trailer? Is it going to change that? So I got scared to want to change it up. I was like, well, do I go with like a spinnerbait type of trailer and just kind of put that on the end? And I had, I mean, I had all types of stuff going through my head. And I was like, well, I don't want to waste no time. And I kept missing fish. They were like short, short striking it. I had a couple of them fall to the boat. And I seen them like, you know, do it like a hard turn on it. So it, it was like, I knew. At, once that fog burned off, I'm looking in the sky, you know, I mean, it was pretty much bluebird. He had a few clouds here and there. And uh, I ended up getting my third, you know, later on. I, I don't know, maybe it was 1030, 1045. Uh, then I, um, I got that fourth one, probably 1231, I guess. Probably like 1230. And man, it was I went through a drought and I seen my club president and he went one way, I kinda went the other way. And I got all types of stuff going through my head. I was like, man, 
I told him, I said, man, dude, that, that one I lost when I was talking to Scott, I said, man, that, that's going to cost me. I mean, I could kind of judge by the way he was fighting. I was like, man, it was a good solid three-pounder. And, I, you know, till this moment, I knew it would have made the difference. And I just, he didn't jump. I just, he, I, I think he just did not have the bait in his mouth very well. It was kind of blueberry sky type of conditions. So I think they were kind of nipping that debate off of, off of, uh, off of reaction. They weren't hitting because, oh, I'm hungry. I want to eat that. It was like, I think they were just nipping at it because of reaction. And once So you missed this really nice one that would have filled out your limit. It's around one o'clock. How did you regain your confidence and your composure to continue through the day? Because we've all been there as anglers where you miss a key fish yeah. and then you're mentally just screwed. What did you do or how did you regain your ability to keep fishing? Man, it was, you know, only thing I could think of was like, man, I fished this hard. I can't quit now. I mean, it just... Yeah, I'm in the semi national final. I just got to keep grinding. You know, I, I, I tell you, you know, there's one guy, one pro guy for, that fishes the MLS, and I just remember he always hashtags it. This is Brian Latimer. It's funny, my, my wife actually went to school with Brian back in the day. Um, they went to Belt and Honey Path, Honey Path. And, and she was like, yeah, he always like farming and, and fishing and stuff like that. And, and, you know, Brian's a really cool guy. I like him, a good family guy. But the one thing that he always says is adversity is dope. And I had some adversity. So I, like, I kind of embraced it and just used that negative energy to put, like, kind of spring me forward. So I was like, I ain't going to quit. And then I thought about this lady that's on my shirt. That's my mom. And, dude, I ain't going to sit here. I ain't gonna sit here and lie. It's like you know, I put on here. She would always say, "You know, I aspire to be great." And you know, I just thought about. It. It's like you know what? Great athletes just don't quit. Michael Jordan never quit. You know, Troy Aikman never quit. You know, all, all these athletes, man, that have all these accolades. You know, Kobe Bryant. They just they didn't quit. Did they have adversity? Of course they did. But they powered their way through. And, I mean, I ain't kidding. My back was hurting. You know, I had to make sure I was hydrated because, you know, it got warm later on that day. You know, and I'm, in the back of my head, I'm like, man, I miss all these freaking fish, man. All I need is, like, probably 12 pounds. I was like, I'm almost guaranteed to get in. And, you know, I pop on this other side, and I get one, like, three pounds. And I'm like, okay, what do I do now? You know, because I'm fishing, I'm fishing. What do I do? Yeah, what do I do yep. now? I, so mm -hmm. I catch that one. like, man, I'm fishing hard, miss the boat, so move on the other side. I come back on the other side and just fish hard. I'm getting tired. I'm, like, frustrated. I'm like, man, I got full fish in the well. I think it's, like, 2 o'clock, I believe. And then I'm, like, man, I'm still chucking that chatterbait. And it's like, oh, shoot, that's a good one. And I, I set the hook. I'm like, oh, dude, this is the one. This is the one. Catfish. I'm like, Ah, I mean, this thing's like six, seven pounds. I'm like, good gosh. And I mean, I, I, man, I, I mean, so I look at that catfish. I said, you know what? It's Sunday. God forgive you. <laughs> you know, so I let him go. I don't know. Maybe 15 minutes goes by. Yeah, you know, chuck that dang on chatterbait again. Oh, that, that is the one for sure. I'm like, what's the chances? And then I, I see. The alligator death roll of a blue cat again. I'm like, he's like saying he's like six and a half, seven pounds. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. Me. And it gets worse. So then <laughs> I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes later. Come here. It's so like two o'clock, right? Yeah, it's like two yeah, it's probably after two at this point. And I'm sitting like, man, I got waiting like I think it was like three fifteen or something. I'm like, man, I gotta get on a stick. Cast it out again. I get a little closer on the grass line. I was like, maybe these cats are hanging way out off the grass. I said, let me come in some because maybe I'm sliding out a little too far. I had incoming tide. I don't know what it is. Even on the Potomac, they seem to like this incoming tide on in, in charter base. I said, let me slide on in the grass line a little more. That didn't work. So the next one, I'm, I'm like, oh, man, this has got to be one. Ain't no way I'm catching three catfish at a time. You know, I said the hook. I was like, oh, yeah, this is a good one. I mean, it's a smaller fish. I'm thinking, okay, this is a good fish. This is a good solid two and a half, three pounds, whatever. Nope. Straper. I'm sitting there like, 
I can't win. I said, what's next? A sturgeon? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, y'all perch, you know, I'm saying a, a bluegill, like if it was a multi teach if it was a multi species tournament, I would have killed everybody. <laughs> and I mean, I'm canceling that thing. I'm going back and forth between the Senko and the Chatterbait. I'm sitting like, I'm like, you know, at this point now, I'm getting worried. I'm like, man, I'm going to be the typical, have a great day, and then the fireball from hell, and I'm going, I'm going to spin out and suck. And I don't know. And the the one thing going forward, you know, that really solidified my day. It made it an awesome day. I remember talking to my co-angler, and he was like 24. I think he's like 27. I think his mom passed. Uh, shoot, no, no, he was 20. Yeah, he was 24. And his mom had passed like six, eight, nine months before the tournament. And mm. like instantly, like we were good. I mean, we, we were good. And I don't know, it's Sunday, you know, I'm thinking about the Lord. I'm like, you know, I said, maybe it's like meant for us to be together. And we had a great time. We had some great talk and everything. We talked about our mom, you know, he, he was talking about his mom and I talked about my mom and how we cope and how we grieve. And it was a, it was a great time. And, um, one of the, one of the things that happened that was, Truly magical, man. Truly magical. Um, I don't know. I looked in the sky and I said, Mom, you know how much I want to do this and how much you know I want to do well. And I said, you got to tap Lord on the shoulder, man. Give me some help. And I, cause I was like, I don't care where I said, I just need one more fish. At that point, you know, I made one good solid cast. I cranked both four or five times and boom. And I didn't. I didn't um, let it bother me. I said, I know this is a good fish. I know it is. And sure enough, she, she come up. I pulled the rod down. And I, I mean, I got to tip in the water and, and keeping it tight. And mm. He came up and netted that fish. And, and he ran up on the front deck and gave me a big old hug. He, he said, that's what I'm talking about. He was more happy for me than he was you know, of him fishing. He didn't even care. He said, man, I, I, I just witnessed one of the greatest things that I have ever seen in bass fishing. And he said, I, I know, I, you know, he didn't know that. And he said, you know, Chris, I, I seen what you did. You were talking to her, wasn't you? I said, yeah, I was. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how much time passed. It was like we were in this aura. It's a blur. It's a blur. It was like a blur. And it's just something that I will absolutely, I, I, I'm telling the truth. I could go to the Bassmaster Classic, and I think that that moment would have been better. I mean, it was simply amazing, and for me, it was like true closure for me and for him. And I told him, I said, man, our moms are both looking at us right now today. And, uh, yeah, and I, I, at that point, I didn't even care how I finished. I didn't, I didn't care. All I knew, I fished hard. I remember her. She she was watching, and at that point, I said, "Wherever the chips lay, I'm happy." And you know, we go to weigh in, or before we uh, came to launch, I mean, we're, we're you know half smacking. Hey, man, Chris, I had a great day with you, and all. And I mean, I mean, he didn't even catch a fish to weigh, and he, he's like pumped. And you know, I've kept his contact information. I forget his name offhand, but I kept his contact information. He's actually a uh, uh, baseball coach in, in Fairfax County working with youth. Great guy. And, um, man, I, I tell you, I went to weigh in and I wasn't worried about it. I said, you know, but, you know, they, I think I had like 10 to 52 or something like that. And I, I really did not care where I, I landed because that was, that was my classic right there. And, you know, they start calling out the, you know, last place team moving all the way up to, you know, the third, second, or first place or whatever. And, you know, I'm here in like eighth place, blah, 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 seventh place, you know, then it gets to fourth. I'm like, ain't no way, you know. And then it's like third, Chris Johnson. I was like, wow. And I could have been like bummed out because you know, I didn't make the, the national finals, but I wasn't. I was happy. And I was happy for those above me that finished. You know, and and I'm still happy for him because 
it was a great tournament. It was it was ran by a great uh, uh, you know group of, of folks, uh, TVF of Virginia, and um, you know I'm hoping that you know Thomas Wooten and Dave McLean um, have a great tournament. You know wherever the uh, national finals going to be, and I hope that they bring it home for Virginia. So I had a great time, and TVF runs great tournaments. Um, I had no problem at all. Everybody's helpful. Everybody's helping each other out. So I had a great time. And I guess the 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 more of all this for, for me was, and for I hope for everybody else, never give up. I know it sounds cliche. I know Mike I can know it says it, but truly, you know, never give up and know where your strength comes from. You know what I mean? Um, it, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. I mean, to be honest with you. The sport is so weird where we we almost downplay like, oh, I only got third out of 87 or 200 boats. Mm -hmm. And it's so weird because in any other sport, if you finish third, it's a great achievement. And it really is. And I think what's such a tough pill to swallow is because of how our sport's set up, it almost feels better if it was a 10th place and not a third place. But the fact is, third is a hell of a finish. And if you did something like that all year, I mean, you're cashing a check as angler of the year. Like, and that's what stinks is, I mean, would, would you have rather had it to be where you you finished lower than finished at third where you're just there? Is is it, that just puts it as a bitter pill, so to speak? Because you should be proud of a third place, like like that's awesome. Yeah, and, and I definitely am, you know, because I, I think what really mellowed me was the way that last fish came, and I was like super excited, super just like thankful. I mean, I, I feel like Richard. Well, who was that that said I'm thankful every time he had a press? It's like I'm thankful. I mean, that's how. I mean, somebody could have. Asked me like fifteen questions, and that's why I would have said I'm, I'm like I'm thankful, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So, and I really was. I mean, because I mean, who? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just a very spiritual person. I mean, it could have been, could have been worse. I could have been in that fall, oh, yeah. hit somebody's boot or whatever. I was just thankful that I had a great day, a great co angler, um, you know. And there's always next time, you know. And I'm always learning. You know, I love this sport. I mean, and I know. Um, yeah, we all want to be competitive. We all want to win. Um, but the only thing I wanted to do was fish the hardest I could and, um, and learn, you know, from my mistakes or, or, and sometimes it's just not in the cards, you know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah, I feel like I could have, you know, been in that position, but, um, it didn't happen. And, you know, it, it'll happen again. I mean, it, you know, just because it didn't happen now. You know, I remember my old supervisor. He would always tell me. He says, "It's yes, no, um, or maybe later." And I mean, I, it's not a no for me. It's, it's a maybe later. You know what I mean? So it makes, and if anything, it makes you drive harder, makes you push harder. And um, you know, I mean, I look at some of those names, and some of them are. I mean, a good friend of mine, Chris Fiore. Good friend of mine. I mean, he's a god. I mean, he guides down there, and you know, feels greater than him. But you know, he had some you know um, issues with his boat and everything. And but I know he can put him in the live world. The boy can fish. Um, Thomas Wooten, you know, he was a winner. Great fish, man. I mean, I mean, you, I mean, you can look at his MLF stats, and I mean, to be up there with Thomas Wooten, I mean, he's a great fisherman. I mean, he's from Region Four. He fishes the BFLs. He fishes. Uh, Smith Mountain Lake, I believe he, I think he had a Toyota Series win um, on the Potomac. So, I mean, he's a good fisherman. I mean, when you're up there in that league with those type of guys, you know, I mean, that's saying something. Um, Larry Kimbler, I mean, he fishes that area a lot. And I think, I don't know, he was somewhere maybe I think in the top 15, I think, or whatever. And he went to the national finals. So, I think in this sport, man, it's 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 anybody's game. You know what I mean? It's anybody's game, and you just have to not too worry about who you're fishing against. Just know you fish against those little green fish, and I'm not I'm not worried about what they do because how I fish is not how you know they fish, and vice versa. So, and I think that's what gives me a clear understanding about this sport, man. It's just like we're not against each other, man. We love what we do. 
you know, we just try to do it in the, in the, in the best way we can and with our skill levels. I mean, I might not be a strong crankbait guy, but, you know, I was a strong jig guy. So we try, we try to fish our strengths. And, you know, there's some great fishermen in, the, in that group. And I was really, you know, thankful just to be amongst those um, in that top, I'm going to say that top 10 or top five or whatever. So, top ugh, three. Yeah, You're top three. <laughs> you know, and it's funny, Tom. I mean, gosh, man, I haven't cashed a check all year. It's like, regionals and everything and then i get to seven extra final and i get a third place i'm like you know but that's what i say when it's your day you know it's your day and i was like you know i was just super thankful man and to my club for believing in me my club president man i mean everybody man they, they, I, did, I didn't just get that third by myself i mean that's the way i feel like it you know because i'm, I'm like the most selfless person and I got a great, great group of guys that I'm fishing with, man. No doubt about it. Now, huge shout out to your club. And you mentioned fishing to your strength. You really relied heavily on the chatter bait. Did, did you mm -hmm. have voices in your head going into day two and as day two grinded through? What made you want to stay with the chatter bait and, and not pivot to maybe, you know, sink in a worm and they're a sinker or something else like that it seemed like that was your what you felt comfortable in and you locked mm -hmm. in is that something that looking back that yep that was the best decision would that something you would have sticked with or, or what's your vibe on that yeah I, I think i still would have you know it just it's just one of the things that you know you know you miss fish and you know i don't know maybe i could have dropped it a little earlier gave them a little more and able to gobble it i, I don't know it, you know it's so like i've experienced the same thing with, with a like a hollow belt hollow uh, body swim bait i've had the same type of thing it's like you know i'm really and you can feel it like doom, doom. it's like okay do i sweep the rod do i drop it then sweep it do i just you know hold hook them and you know that day i just I, I couldn't dial in on how how the hook set them. You know what I mean? I I wasn't sure. And you know, the only thing that was going through my head, I was like, well, if I if I drop it and then apply a hook, you know, they'll feel that weight and they they'll just kick it out. So I was like, well, maybe I can just reel down until I feel pressure and then you know set the hook. But I, I'm honestly, man, it's like no point that I really feel like, oh man, I maybe I should throw a wake bait or I should throw, you know, a minus one or I should throw some crank bait or or spreader bait. You know, I was just so locked into it because all I think it was a, I honestly think it was a confidence thing, man. I, I've been throwing that thing all year long. I've been fishing Potomac. I've been posting it all on Facebook. You know about throwing the chatter bait and you know it's. Man, from for me, the chatterbait, um, two lows, the chatterbait and the Senko, man, been to me been game changers, um, you know, and that's kind of what I threw. You know, I knew if I could slow down, or if they were in a funk, I knew I could catch them on that Senko. If they wanted that moving bait, I mean, it was like they're gonna eat this thing. I mean, they can't stand it, and it's been working for me. I I don't know. I just think it's a confidence thing, man. I just think it's a confidence thing, and I just as a professional chatterbait angler, because I, I have I'm terrible with chatterbaits, and so I'm gonna lean to you here with this. I think like the Ned Riddick and the Cinco are two baits that I think in 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 30 years fish will still get fooled on that. It's gonna be hard for them to get really turned off to it. And, but then I look at like a Whopper Plopper, and that was like hot for sh like a flash in the pan, and then it's <laughs> harder to get that bite. Is the chatter where do you feel like on the chatter bait? Because it's weird. It's not like the whopper plopper where the fish have turned off that bite, but is it gonna be like the Cinco in, in 10 years where it's like you can still pick that thing up, or is it gonna be more situational? What's your what's your thoughts on that? I think there's always gonna be a place for it. I mean, as you see with Z-Man, they're doing you know different, you know, uh head co uh, configurations, different blade configurations. You know, uh you got other companies like uh, Berkeley that uh, developed the uh, like the slobber knocker, and um, of course Z Man has that patent out there. Um, is there other channel baits that are better? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's it's like me personally. I mean, I don't use a Yamamoto Senko. I, I have used them, and I have a few packs of them. Mm -hmm. But I've been using the Young Dinger and. 
of course, like a lot of people say, oh, they're knockoffs. But I mean, I've been using those knockoffs for like 15 years. Uh, before that, I was going through a company in Nebraska. Uh, I can't remember the name of them now, but they, I don't know if they stopped some, but they, they got a different owner anyway. But um, they were called trick sticks, and they looked just like a young digger. I, I, I almost believe it was the same hmm. old. And they were good for years back when I was fishing a little e series deal in Westmoreland County in Virginia. And these guys were like, man, what type of sickles are you using or whatever? And I was like, called trick sticks. And they had a bunch of different colors and they were working, you know, they were working great for me. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I don't think the charity bait is going to die anytime soon. Uh, it's like the frog, it, you know. I mean, I think a lot I of guys that earlier, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people were throwing, you know, either it was it was like two brands, like it was like I think Slag Proof, and then you had yeah. like Pros, and like a majority of guys on the Potomac were throwing, you know, Spros. And but you know, working with River to Sea at the time, you know, like I was using the River to Sea Frog, and I was still catching fish. And I think the reason why. There was no availability of it, or there was no brand awareness of the River to Sea frogs, so nobody was throwing. So it looked brand new to them. So I think you know what has to happen is you just gotta give them a different look. Like I said before, it's almost like you know a, a dog. They see that same chew toy all the time. It's like, dude, I don't want that. <laughs> you know. So you have to give them something just a little bit different. You know mm -hmm. and. Now, I will say this. I think you asked that asked that question earlier. What I would probably have done, and I mean, I didn't disclose the color. I was using more of a kind of like a crystal flash color, um, and it was white on the top side. And, and I, of course, I make my own skirts. And then I used um, like chartreuse on the side. So let me plug this thing in. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. No, because that, that's interesting. I always think about in a multi-day tournament, like the adjustment factor is so important between day one and day two, especially when you talk about your boat launch number, who's going to get to your spot, who's fished in the area. I mean, it's one thing when you're the first person there, but it's yeah. completely different when you have no idea how long that person's been there, how hard they've pounded it. And, and is it a big adjustment? Do you go from a chatterbait to a spinnerbait, or is it just a color change? Like, is it something subtle that we got to do to get that extra commitment from them? And see, I got, I got locked, man. I, I got locked, and truth be told, I had a black and blue tied up, and I probably could have squeezed in a few more there, given because I, you know, you think about it, you're fishing for two days. Mm -hmm. They're saying that same chatterbait for two days. You know, that's how Pamela might have seen it the first day, and he's seen it again on the second day. He's like, I seen that yesterday. I need to throw something else. And I got locked. And I get, you know, and that black and blue one, you know, I ended up putting in a rod lock. I mean, they two only had two rods on my boat. I literally wow. had two that rods on my boat. Confidence. <laughs> I mean, I, I had two rods on my boat. And before that, uh, man, I ain't going to lie. I had like, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, two spinning reels. You know, and then once I had that confidence, I was like, well, I, I don't need all this. I mean, I want to I wanna do what I can do. I want to break dance on this thing. That's some room. You know, I'm fishing out of 18, 10, you know, Triton. And I'm like, you know, I, I want some room. And I, that I feel so good. cool because that reminds us of like we talked about earlier about leading the race. If you were a little bit lower in the standings going to day two, do you have more rods on the front of your deck? Like if you're not in third place, does that change your mindset when you go to the spot? It's so interesting to think of it that way. You know, I yeah, I mean it's a good question, man. I mean, I'm always looking for big fish. I mean, if I had, let's say, I had eight nine pounds, I, maybe I would have did something different, you know. But I don't know, man. I just, I just know that Chad Bay will stick them. I mean, I just, mm. I just know. It. I, I mean, I just have so much confidence in that thing, man, and. um when I pre fished two weeks before, I'd say 90% of the fish I caught was on a chatterbait. Matter of fact, I don't I think all of them I caught was on a chatterbait. So it's just, I don't know, man. I think the biggest thing for me that has helped me, I, I don't know, man. I know what to feel when I'm, for, I mean, I guess some guys, you know, when you think about a jig, I mean, I think about Danny Brown, you know, you know, you, you know, Amen. you know, you think about clone, you think crankbait. So, I guess for me, 
it was like Chatterbait was my thing. I knew what to throw. I knew kind of what colors to go to. And I don't know, for some reason, you know, I mean, I went with three main colors for all, all I'm just going to say all the river systems in general. Of course, I'm, I, I went with the fire crawl. I know everybody's seeing like, you know, March, April, everybody's, Timeline is lit up with fire crawling jigs and swim baits and, mm. <laughs> and and everything else. So you know, I threw it and it works. I mean, it works. It works. I mean, then from that, I went to you know your standard uh, sexy shad bait fish style pattern. Then I went to you know your black and blue, and black and blue on a Potomac is just like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, it's it's just it's a it works. So, for the most part, I only went. I mean, I, I was true. I was a true American man. I went red, white, and blue. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but that mean, man, that 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 you know, those colors been been great for me. Now, I'm I'm gonna be real honest with you. You know, when it comes to chatterbaits or and jigs, and and you know, of course, I'm I'm staffed with fishingspirits.com and, and Boss Jigs. You know, I'm really good friends with the owner of, of Fishing Skirts and. Oh my gosh, man! I, man, I'm trying to remember when I got with him. My God, I think he's been like the longest running sponsor I've been with. Probably, been, I mean, I know it's been over ten years. I think it's been almost twenty. It's been a while, and you know, we're working on some things and some real big things, and you know, hope you know, hopefully, you know, be some other bigger term is kind of coming up and everything. So. Um, I, you know, that, that being said, man, I, I just knew how to customize that color. I mean, you know, fish the moment, like I, I can only will always say, you know what I mean? If you look at your live well, you got a crawl and it's got some green pumpkin and red, you know, and, and black or brown or whatever, you know, I carry that skirt tool. I, I promise you, I wish I ever had it with me. I use my, you know, if you're interested in it, you just go to fishingskirts.com. Let's search more on there and just look for your, you know, your skirt tool on there. And, and I'll link this guy's, I'll link all of his sponsors in the episode description along with his guide service. So you guys can click right on the links and find this stuff. One thing that we talked about on our phone call before this was like about crabs and like how it's weird how like on the, on the Chesapeake Bay, cause I fished that a lot for college regional tournaments. And sometimes on the James, these suckers got fangs. Like these bass have like big ass teeth. On them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> is that why the black and blue is a vibe that works for them? Is like, are they keying in on like crabs or fiddler crabs or stuff like that? You think? Yeah, man, I'm gonna tell you something. When, when I was on that James River, of course, I'm a tidal tidal guy, and I fish salt water. And Thomas, this was some of the biggest number one Jimmy crabs I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, I I'm in the tournament, like, man, I want to scoop him up, man, and sting him, man, <laughs> tonight. You know, but um. There were some huge crabs there, and I think we get locked into like the the common crawfish and threads and shad. When you fish a tidal body of water, man, you got so much of a uh, diverse menu. And I went to one of the backs of these creeks, and I'm telling you, it looked like something off of National Geographic. I was in there looking at these fiddler crabs, and it's like, I promise you, I. I, I it could have been almost a thousand. I I'd never seen so many fiddler crabs. Of course, it's low tide. And they're on the mud banks, and going in this creek, y'all. All I hear, I was like, "Well, somebody got got," <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know. And I I was like, "Oh my god," you know. So you know, and, and it kind of cued me on something else. I, I really want to try that, um, especially during summertime. It's some type of fiddler crab color. Because I think mm. we think about crab, we think about you know your your you know crawfish like your rusty crawfish, um, you know. But I you know, and, and of course we're thinking about uh, you know crab and all. But I, you know, I never thought about fiddler crab, and there's a humongous population of fiddler crabs on the James River, and it kind of from what I remember when I seen. I mean, I'm in tunnel vision because I'm in tournament, but. They were kind of almost like a peachish white color. I said, huh. I said maybe I'll, I'll kind of put a chatterbait together with that one, Jig. That's why white works. Okay, that makes and, sense. And 
um, you know, that's that's one of the one of the key things that I tell guys all the time, all the time. Um, definitely look in your live well. Check on your fish, cut your stuff off, see if you see anything floating around in there. And I lost, I did lose a couple of ounces too, man. I, I mean, there was three fish had that were puked up, so. Um, I didn't have any juju, unfortunately, and that probably would have helped me. I mean, it ain't a problem. It, it works. I mean, the stuff works. And I tell any of these guys that turn anglers, man, juju's. I forget the other companies out here. Any of the lives, even, even hydrogen peroxide, because it increases the oxygen uh, in your live well. That's another thing that helps. You know, just keep, and you can just keep that in your boat. It's really easy. To, I mean, you can get out of the Dollar Tree, the Dollar Store, you know, so um, you don't have to ride the Bass Pro Shop to get some type of live well treatment. But during the summertime, yeah, you want to really get that oxygen uh, levels going going up really good. Well, one um, thing I want to I want to put a pin on on this part here, which is your chatterbait. What is your chatterbait setup? Because we haven't talked about that yet. Um, mm -hmm. What is your overall setup for success? Well, you know, I you know. This is me. I, I know there's a lot of different uh, technique specific. Excuse me, technique specific rods out here. I don't really have technique specific rods um, that I personally use. Um, this is just I, I. This is my personal opinion. When it comes to rod companies, everybody's medium heavy seven foot is not the same. You know, diamond rods, lose uh, phoenix. Everybody out here is not the same. I think it's a personal preference, but for me, for me, um, I've been using like the my twos, um, medium heavy action, but I want a fast tip. I want something that's got backbone. I can rip that channel bait out the grass, but I can feel it if he breathes on it. That's that's what I want in, in, in a rod, um, and, and and it's been great for me. And fluorocarbon or mono or braid or that's another good question. So this is for me. Okay, I'm a this is just for me, and I mean, I could have different opinions, but this is just for me, okay? First of Potomac River, you got some areas that are clean, you got some areas that got a little stain, and people swear, oh, they can see that braid, they can see that braid. Man, I, I've, I've used braid on Lake Anna, on, on a shaky head, straight braid. And does it, does it matter? I don't know. Is it a conference thing? Definitely. But what I have learned and what I do now, I'll big shout out to my boy Jeremy May. I gonna lie. So I would, I don't know. I had some type of knot that was almost like an improved clinch knot on both sides and it was working. I don't even know what you call it, but it was working. It always looked like a double unit, but um I've been using it for like four or five years. Um and I can test the knot strength. I mean, it got pulling pretty hard for a break. But I tried this lefty cray knot and Hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's the business. It's definitely the business. But all, all that said, I will use now on my shaky head rods uh, when I fish an Anna. Yeah, I, I will use full cob leader. You know, I'll use pretty much the, the length of the rod or, just, or a little shorter because what I I don't want that knot. I don't even want that knot like to go up there. You know, pass pass. You know, the uh, first guy. So. Do you feel like I don't remember how I wear this? Is, is floor do they overhype fluorocarbon? Because if you watch the elites and a lot of the professional anglers, and they're like, "I'm using this Japanese like fluorocarbon made from a unicorn's ass that's yeah. three pound test, <laughs> and because of this, I get more bites." Is that just a very niche situation when that actually helps? Because the fact is, you're right. You could go throw braid out there, and a lot of times you're going to catch fish even in gin clear water. Yeah, you know, you know, I. I <laughs> I had one company on the West Coast, and I ain't going to mention their name. Great, great stuff, man. I knew samples of their stuff. and But it was just, the you know, to be staffed for a company like that and try to sell it to the everyday angler, I was like, man, it ain't going to work, man. You know, so, yeah, I've been with Gamma. Oh, my gosh. That was another I don't know how long I've been with Gamma. And... It's you know Gamma's been great. You know, I've been using the Gamma Torque. I think um, my friend um, Captain Steve Chaconis, he's been using Gamma Torque. Um, now on my on my drop shot, yeah, I'll use like I'll, I'll go down to six or even seven pound uh, Gamma Edge. 
Um, so I, I think they're, I don't know, man. It, it's, I'm a musician too. You know, you gotta do what works for you, man. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, there's some, there's like guitars that, that some, some people like Epiphone, some people like, you know, you know, Yamaha or whatever, you know what I mean? It's the same thing, you know, I, I never get caught up in the gear hype, man. You go with what works for you. And mm-hmm. like for me, I've been using Gamma for a while. Before that, I was using, you know, Power Pro. And, and I think some of these brands, they, they change too. A lot of the, the way they make them, I think, can change. And I've noticed some of the stuff. You know, I'm not going to mention any companies out here. You know, I don't, I don't want to bash their names, but I've used some of their products in. It's like, it was like post pandemic, man, it ain't, it's just not the same. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, I, I think that was a, a, another big key thing for me. And it was like some of the brands, man, I had stopped using because they just, it's not, and I know it's not the same. You know, so, and I think one of the problems is is just the availability of um, product to 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 make it the final product and everything. So instead of going to Vietnam or China, I mean, eighty ninety percent of the industry now is is China or Taiwan. And, you know, that's just how it is, unfortunately. So, no. Uh, now. Your history, did you saltwater fish first before you got into bass fishing? And how has that, has that helped you become a better tidal water angler because you deal with tides all the time? Oh, all day long, man. All day long. And, and it was crazy because the same type of thing I've noticed on the James is the same type of thing i even seen today, man. It's, you know, once that tide gets to moving, you got a good two hours. Then they'll still bite, but it gets a little tougher. But those, that first hour, I'm going to say that first hour. Man, it is absolutely magical. I mean, it's, I mean, today on the lower Potomac, I mean, it was, I mean, it was a bird show. I mean, I, there must have been a thousand of them out there, you know, but, and, you know, and again, you know, you got to study your graphs, study your graphs. Don't just look at, you know, what you see, study your graphs. Um, that's, that's a huge, huge, huge factor. But, you know, understanding that tide flow, man, that, that was the biggest thing for me um and then understanding too as a title angler man they're not just eating thread fin chad or blue back heron i mean they got a plethora of food to eat you know what i mean and um this year was crazy i, I think i seen a facebook post from a lady um on one of the, the outdoor groups and i think she got a flounder in like ways bay or something That's it was crazy. 62 62 64 degrees and the lady catches a flounder in Wade's Bay. I mean, it's just kind of, <laughs> that's crazy. But And guys, you need to see this because I'm going to see if I can bring this up on his channel here. Like, this yeah. is absolutely the that was insane. action here. <laughs> that, was, that was just that, insane. That's insane. That is a, is that all bait that they're, they're, they're hitting right now? And that's all bait that they're diving on, you know. And the thing is, there's, there's so much bait in that area. There's, but there's like there's more bait than there are stripers. So you literally can pull up in an area like that, but you still got to look at your side imaging because guys, you know, you got the big boat guys. You can kind of see the guy right there on that right. He was kind of like trolling and stuff. There's a few guys that are light tackle casting and jigging. So, you know, honestly, I think um, I learned a lot about um, – freshwater fishing from the salt and vice versa, you know, um, you know, cause a lot of the tidal guys, you know, that just dedicate the salt water. I'm not sure if they really use their salt, their side imaging like that. I think they're still mm. die hard on like 2d. I mean, they might, you know, go to, uh, you know, cause a lot of guys just don't want to spend that type of money, but, um, you know, some of the guys going out there with active target and everything. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but but it would be so, I, I'd like to see it. It would be cool to see though. As a saltwater guy, like 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 that that picture, that video you just put us. What what mm-hmm. are you targeting right now? Is it primarily striper, uh, or are you also doing like trout, redfish? Like what, what's running right now? Yeah. So yeah, the water's definitely cooler right now. Um, early in the year, man, I caught like the biggest speckled trout man I ever caught on the Lower Potomac. I think really? it was like probably two or three pounds. I mean, which. Yeah, I mean, I think it was like like twenty inches, which is pretty good for the section of the river I was fishing. 
and you go toward uh, the lower Rappahannock and Reedville, Virginia, you you get more into your reds and, and your specs around that area. Um, and you can still catch those fish, but what's happening is they'll start migrating toward the mouth of the bay, um, you know, closer to like Newport News and Elizabeth River and those areas like that. Um, but it's been kind of a, it was been a dry summer. You know, we didn't get a lot of rain, and it pushed a lot of saltwater species like way up the river. I mean, of course, there was a, I think there was something on Facebook and and even on YouTube that guy had a drone and had a uh, visual on a bull shark chasing like Manhattan, like around Littletown, Maryland. And what I'm what I'm understanding, I've been I was living in Air Force almost thirty years, like Breton Bay. If you go on your your Navy honest, you can kind of see like Breton Bay. It's an area, uh, I believe it's near, say, like St. George's Island, kind of down a river on, in that in that area. And yeah, that's a good map there. Yeah, so I think Sorry, Breton River. Bay, yeah. So this so, area right in here? So, so yeah, like right in that area there is, I think, is that St. Mary's River? Yeah, that's, so that's the mouth of the Potomac right there. Mm -hmm. And that area, I think your curse was just in. I kind of cut my teeth around that area, year comico, and oh wow, and those are so I've literally fished from Point Lookout, Smith Point area. I mean, I've I'm telling you, I've did some crazy stuff, man. <laughs> I actually, I got to tell this story, this is crazy. So, I, I, I think it's on my Facebook page. Oh my gosh, so this was last year, I believe last June. My dad comes up from Mississippi. This is no joke, no lie. I mean, it's it's all Facebook. So I'm like, Dad, they catch us some Spanish mackerel, you know, down there by uh, like Kilmarnock area down that way. This is like the mouth of a Rappahannock, man. This is like way down the river. And so I got this uh, product. It was called a folding troll. And basically, what you would do, you would put it where your back seat post is, and you they had like this little cleat system, like you tie it to your cleats. So it wouldn't move either way. Man, dude, I'm out there in, in my Triton. The same one I used <laughs> to get that third on the Chicken Harmony. I'm using that boat, man. I'm trolling like pin 330s, like four pin 330s. And I'm trolling with like number one planers and, and, and clock spoons. And I'm catching Spanish mackerel. So, you know, that's How one of the... How far out were you? Good God. Oh, man. I mean, dude, I was basically in the Chesapeake Bay. I mean, I was in the Chesapeake Bay. So, I mean, it's just it's just one of the things, man. I I just been, you know, I you know, I you just gotta know how to pick your days, and it's, it's crazy because I go down to Mississippi usually once a year to visit my dad, and um, man, I thought I was crazy, and those guys, man, they would go. I mean, this this was one day, man. It was nice and calm. This dude had like a sixteen foot jump, but he's like like at the barrier islands. Of Biloxi, Biloxi Bay. I mean, wow! And I couldn't believe it, man. And but you know, it, it's it's different, man. It's it's way different. There's not as much tide flow. It's it's we were 17 feet of water. And I was throwing, you know, I don't know, three ounce jig. And it was almost dropping like straight down. And you know, I'm reeling in. Gary make a cast. We're trying to kiss smash. Uh, excuse me, not smash macro. Uh, speckle trout, man. And this thing scared the pee out of me. And it was a like a 30, 40 pound Cravel Jack, you know, just came up right toward the <laughs> his way. And my dad looked, he's like, Yeah, I seen it. He's like, I caught one, you know, in Biloxi Bay. And he had a freaking, like a, a pen, I forget what that little spin fish was. It was a graphite one. It spooled him. So it was, you know, those things can pull hard. Those they pull hard as crap, you know. I'm sitting there like, man. But you know that's that's one of the things that I've learned. I, I I don't know. I just have an addiction to fishing. It doesn't matter if it's salt water or fresh water, man. I, I love it all, and um, I just been very fortunate, man, just to be able to be on both sides of the coin. And I, I think to any of those anglers that are aspiring to be bass anglers or want to go into the salt, you already got half the stuff down. You know, so if you're a bass guy, you want to do some light tackle jigging and, and top water. Excuse me, you already got it. You know, if I mean, if you're used to jigging lake handle or, or cur, 
you know, use a jigger spoon or, or even Chesnut. I think my boy, um, you know, Chris Fiore, he's using big old, I call them Lake Fork spoons. That's what I call them. And he catches them from those trees and stuff. You know, um, what's that? Briar Creek, same thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those techniques, man, and you use your side imaging. You use, you're looking for bait. And where there's bait, there's bass. So, I mean, you're using those same techniques. You're using those same uh, type of areas, points, bays, things like that. So it's always a, a, a good help, man. If you're coming into the salt, you're a bass guy, you already got half of it. If you're a salt guy and you come into the, the world of bass fishing, well, you already understand deep deep structure and everything. So it's um it's it's been an amazing journey, man. And with my God service, man, it's just it's made me so diverse, man. I mean, I, I mean, I love it and. I've had How clients. long have you been doing that? This is here. this has actually been my first year, and okay. I, I'm telling you, catching the fish is great. But the I, I, the clients, I mean, the friendships that I have developed, man, it's just been it's been amazing. It's been absolutely amazing, and I think yeah, the money is great, but I yeah, every business wants to succeed and be profitable. But I think I get more joy of making somebody happy. And I think that's the end of the day. I talked to one of my clients today who's going with me Saturday. We're going we're going to the bird show on Saturday. So I told her about it, sent her some pics, and she was like, Oh my gosh, you know, so she's excited to do that. It's her you know, husband's birthday. So, you that's know, cool. and, and I know, you know, I, I and that's the part I like. I like to make people happy. I did like three birthday trips this year. So it's been cool. That's so cool. You know, so but you know, it's um uh, one of the things you know. I I do four hours, six hour, or eight hour trips. Typically, most guys do six hours. I ain't gonna lie, eight hours is a long day. <laughs> it's a long day. But most of your recreational guys that want to go out and have a good time, you know, six hours is is pretty good. And you know, there's other guys out here. Um, that guy, a good friend of mine, Thomas Harden. He guys, we've been friends for a long time. I mean, we don't down each other. We don't talk about, oh, I'm a better guy. Ain't none of that, man. And that's the whole thing that I've noticed um, in, in this industry, man. We we work together. If I'm not on nothing, hey, you know, check out this. Area. I mean, that's what we do. We help each other out because I'm not going to be on all the time, and they're not going to be on all the time. So, But at the end of the day, we want to make our clients happy, you know. So, we, we, we you know, we work together. And this, I got no – actually um, – like Captain Steve Chacon like Captain Steve, like always been a stand up guy for me. I, I mean, I mean, he was every time if I have an issue, I just call him. I mean, he's a great mentor, man. He's been doing it for oh my god, almost as long as I've been living, like thirty plus years, and he's seen a bunch of changes in the industry and everything. So, um, you know, anytime I have an issue, you know, I, I talk to Steve. He's a great guy, and uh, you know, he's a he, he's an amazing guy, that's all I can say. And, and a heck of a writer, heck of an editor. He, he know, really is. He, he, yeah, no, huge shout out to, to Mr. Uh, Captain Chaconis. Uh, you know, he's been on the show a bunch of times and, you know, he, he's a great source. I mean, Chris, we covered a lot of things tonight. Is, is there anything Absolutely. else that, that we've missed that you'd like to cover? Anything else you want to talk about? Man, you know, only thing I can say is, you know, fishing the DMV, you know, I'm praying to y'all, you know, Brand just, skyrockets man and i mean we have like we have great fisheries in this area really and do. not not just like our big areas like potomac rappahannock york the james you know the patuxent even in maryland um you know the upper bay you know so um you know this area is just full 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 of great areas and great anglers too i mean i've met more of these I'm gonna say Generation X and Y anglers and things, and yeah, they're they're smart. I mean, these kids are smart, and I, th you know, I think if there's anything I can learn, I can um, drop for these young anglers, man. Keep doing what y'all doing. I mean, I see a lot of these guys doing their TikTok content, their the Instagram stuff, man. I, I mean, some of this stuff, man, is like completely funny. I mean, it's, oh yeah, it. I mean, it's it's amazing, and it's like entertaining. I mean, I subscribe and everything, man. It's you know, I mean, I forget the one kid. He's out of, uh, uh, gosh, I, I can't think of his hashtag or whatever. But he's like, um, he got to deal with Bass Pro Shop. He's like 17. You know what I mean? 
one rod, one reel? Uh, not him. Oh gosh, I gotta find this thing. I think he's like Pax River or something. I okay, think yeah, it's, yeah. But he's a kid, and I I remember this was like two years ago, and um, I talked to him, and I didn't know. I thought he was like with his dad or something like that. And, I didn't know, man, but he's got like a fully wrapped truck, fully wrapped boat. It was like, man, you know, but, you know, the, the kid is like really good on camera. And, you know, the main thing is um, that I tell a lot of these young people, you know, brand yourself and and make sure that you're um, brand yourself well. You know what I mean? Keep your cool. Keep your composure. Um, because, you know, it's a reflection of, of you and your attitude and you're a reflection of those companies that you're, you're representing. So, but I'm real proud of the young young people, man, that are uh, keeping this sport alive, man. And, and, yeah, it's a different, oh, man, it's way different from the 80s and the 90s and even the early 2000s when I got into it. But, you know, seeing these young people kind of take over the sport, man, and, and, you know, it's just amazing. It just it, it amazes me. So, I appreciate you so much for having me on the show tonight, man. It's just, and I'm always going to be looking to, um, to do some fish reports with you. Maybe even take me take you out, man. No, you know? absolutely. And Chris, I want to have you on again because there's so many things that I mean, I, you are a wealth of knowledge, and, and not just about the bass fishing, but I want to talk about the bay and like there's so many fun topics we get into about like the blue cats, how they're growing, the netting. Uh, I know I just saw an article by um, the uh, Chesapeake Bay Association about I guess there's a Canadian company that's like netting a lot of the bait fish in the bay, possibly. Like there's a lot of things that are in this area we could talk about that's not just bass fishing that that has to do with fishing in the area. And I'd love Absolutely. to have you back on and talk about it. Yeah, I I got to talk with you, you know, because I I actually um, I'm not sure how we can do it with maybe even a third person. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. I um I I'm, I may talk with um he's the commissioner for PRFC, Mr. Martin Gary. Had a really good conversation with him, man, and he actually worked for the state of Maryland as well as fisheries ecologist. And uh, he, man, he's a really smart guy, a cool guy, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to to working with him and possibly working with the Potomac River Fishers Commission so we can, you know, keep our water in good shape, man, yes. and for generations. Because again, so. and this is something about the show, guys, that you listen. You know, I have the DNR on from Virginia, from Maryland. We talk about it. Regardless of the species that you catch, they're all in the same body of water. And if we mm -hmm. can protect the bodies of water, we can help all the different fishes. I know I got in a lot of hot water with like the catfish debate, but the point is we need to have these conversations <laughs> because you know we're not building any more massive lakes. You know we only have so no. many tidal estuaries, and we got to make sure we all communicate on how we can maximize their potential yeah. in the future. Amen. That's right. But and then, dude, and then guys, like always, all of his information will be in the episode description, including his guide service and all of his sponsors. Please like and subscribe to his channel. And if you guys could, please like and subscribe to this one. It really helps in the algorithm. And then we might be talking a little bit longer, but we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.